So we've just discussed the strategies for reopening schools and businesses based on the indoor safety guideline for the given space and the various physical parameters uh, in, that, in that space. And the new concept we added was the prevalence of infections. So we would know on average how many infected people we might expect in a room. And as that number goes to zero, as the pandemic subsides, we can switch from a more restricted situation with an occupancy N1 prescribed by the original guideline based on the indoor reproductive number to kind of increasing occupancy up to N0, which is the normal original occupancy initially with masks. And as the prevalence goes down, we switch to taking the mask off and really returning back to normal. Uh, so I'd like to take this a little further now um, and ask what, how would we change our policies or this discussion here if we not only have information about the prevalence infection, but we also have an understanding of immunity, which could be acquired through vaccination or through previous exposure. And especially right now, as I'm recording this lecture in early 2021 and several vaccines have rolled out for uh, COVID-19, uh, this is um, a topic of, uh, of great interest. <clears throat> So let's think about what, how would we take into account susceptibility? So in some sense, this was a conservative estimate of the true risk of transmission because we haven't, we've assumed that everyone who's not infected is susceptible. But of course, as immunity is increased in the population, we're, we're going to have to modify that. So instead of having uh, our, our uh, po populations of susceptible um, and, and infected persons being sampled, you know, kind of sort of a, from a two state or two category uh, process, we can think of three categories. There can be, um, a, a, you know, PI is the probability that a person is infected, which means really, again, that they're infectious and they can infect other people. And this is coming from the local population that is entering that indoor space. And now we're going to add PS, which is the probability that a person is susceptible. And then the third category is PM, which is the probability that the person is immune. And so these, we have a three category uh, process, so those three should add up to one. So this is one minus PI plus PS. And we can also further write this as PVAC, the probability that a person has been successfully vaccinated and is actually has acquired immunity, plus the probability of previous exposure, we'll call that PX. So this would be uh, vaccination, and this would be previous exposure if that previous exposure has actually led to immunity. And that's a controversial topic still under research and may depend on the specific population at hand. But let's imagine that we have subsets of what these numbers are, and then we'd like to see how to adjust our, our thinking here. So it's, uh, we're still going to base our guideline on saying that the expected number of transmissions is the expected number of infected times susceptible, so the expected number of pairs times the uh, average transmission rate, uh, <clears throat> average of beta times tau the time, and that that expected number of transmissions should be less than our tolerance epsilon. So that's still our, our guideline. So what we're really trying to consider now are different assumptions about this expected number of infected susceptible pairs that are in the room. And we've broken that down into three risk scenarios. And let's revisit that now with our, uh, our three category model. So so the first risk scenario was, we're in, was uh, <clears throat> describing a desire to limit spreading of the disease through this indoor space. This is our original goal. And by that we mean if an infected person enters the room, then we would like to make sure that it's unlikely that a new case would emerge from transmission from that person. So in that case, we have i is equal to 1. And uh, then, so there, then now i is known. So this is just the expected value of s. And the expected value of s, though, in this new model, is the number of other people in the room, n minus 1, times ps. So you see now, when I define my 
indoor reproductive number as uh, n minus 1 times uh, beta tau, and I want to bound that to be less than epsilon, that's my typical guideline, there's this extra factor ps which could be moved to the other side. So one way to think about it is since ps is less than 1, we are increasing that tolerance because there are fewer susceptible, pe susceptible people. So we're allowed to stay in the room longer, have a higher occupancy, lower ventilation, etc. So this is one case. The next case is to limit transmission. So here we're not going to assume that an infected person actually is there, but we are going to consider the possibility that there is an infected person there. So that makes transmission a lot, potentially a lot less uh, likely. And so what we like to do here is to look at the expected value of i times s. Now, I won't go through the details, but for the trinomial distribution with three uh, independent uh, uh, possibilities with these probabilities, and you're making uh, n samples from that distribution, you can show that the, uh, the expected value of this product is actually n, n minus 1, times pi times ps, by very similar arguments as we have uh, done for the binomial uh, case. Um, one way to think about this is that n, n minus 1 is the number of permutations of two people that can be made in that room. So if you pick one person to be first the infected and the other one to be the susceptible, th this is the number of such pairs, and PIPS is the probability of each of those instances. So this is uh, the expected number of i to s pairs. And I put a directionality here because we are distinguishing each individual person. So if I take two people, I am counting differently if one is infected, the other one's susceptible, or the reverse situation, since everyone's a unique individual. OK, so if we then substitute into this formula then, notice now we've picked up uh, some extra factors. So now the, now the guideline would read that Rn will be less than epsilon over n times pi, which is something we already had before. But now there's also a ps. So that's modified. And finally, our third risk scenario was uh, to limit personal risk. So this is the case where s is equal to 1. I'm only worried about one susceptible person, and that's me. And I'm then. In this, if s is known, then we just have the expected value of i, um, which is just um, uh, n minus 1, all the other people, times pi. And if you plug that into the formula, then you find that rn is now bounded by epsilon divided by pi. So take into account both prevalence of infection and susceptibility, at least these somewhat modified bounds. And let's focus on where the changes took place. So first of all, in the original guideline for limiting spreading, we can be a little bit more lenient. So as there's more vaccination, more immunity, we don't need to keep holding that guideline at the same level, even in the most sort of conservative stance of trying to limit spreading. What's more interesting for this plot here is the middle one. So now we again pick up a factor of PS, but everything else is the same. So what it means is that relative to the calculation that I showed here, I should actually make the very same plot where I don't just plot pi in this axis, but I actually plot pi times ps, where ps is the probability of being susceptible, which is related to vaccination and previous exposure rates. So that actually does bring this down and hence make, make it easier to make the decision to relax restrictions and even ultimately take off the mask, because as a combination of these two factors, we're, we're getting even more safe. Interestingly, uh, down here for personal risk, uh, we don't really care about the probability susceptibles because the only person I care about in that situation is myself. And so I don't have any effect of susceptibility, only the effect of infection.